Today we have Dr. Andrew Uberman on getting rid of your ADHD. I'm curious about this because we were talking about it a little bit when we were working out, but you mentioned that when you were younger that um, you didn't have the best ability to focus. And nowadays you sit down for hours on end reading study after study, research after research. And it's just, just interesting seeing who you are now versus who you were before. I think a lot of people have a problem focusing these days and they're trying to figure out, am I, do I have ADD? Like, am I not able, is that just not something I'm going to be able to do? With a lot of people struggling with that, what are some practical things that they can start to try to implement so that they can increase their ability to focus on single tasks at, their, at that moment in time? Yeah, well, the phone is definitely detrimental to this because you have so many contexts within your phone. I mean, your phone is showing you 50, with the equivalent of like 50 television shows in, mm -hmm. in 10 seconds, so, you know, flip, 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 maybe not yeah. 10 seconds, 20 seconds. But, um, you know, the brain will follow the visual system in so many ways. So if you really want to enhance your ability to focus, mm -hmm. put the phone away for two minutes, literally two minutes, just put it across the room or in another room, sit down, pick a point on the wall and just try and relax, breathe however you want while maintaining visual focus for 120 seconds on a location. You can blink if you want to. Uh, if you don't need to blink, don't blink because actually every time you blink, you reset your time perception. Mm. Blinks are like a curtain in a, in a play or a, it's like a scene clapper in the, for movies. But just sit there and try and extend the amount of time that you can focus. And again, you can blink what you'll find is it, it's incredibly boring and agitating. Like most things you need to focus on and have a hard time focusing on. So we all can focus much better on things we really, really enjoy. But just a little bit of focus training for two, three minutes every once in a while will teach you to recognize when you have that impulse to get up and move or, and it, or suddenly jump to another activity. And what you'll find is that it carries over to a really terrific ability to read, to study, to listen, and you start to notice those internal signals, like why the urgency to move? Why the urgency to go away? Well, maybe the conversation's no good and you want to get away. That's fine. That's a different matter. But there's something you need to do and you don't want to do it or you can't focus. It's fine to think about hydration, food, caffeine. That's great. But chances are you just haven't really taught your brain how to focus. So start with your visual focus and then let your mental focus follow that. I still do this for a couple minutes each day. I'll go outside, I'll take a walk, which is no focus, everything just walking by. And then I'll finish by, instead of looking at my phone, I'll try and just pick a point. People probably think I'm pretty strange if they see me doing this. <laughs> just pick a point and look at that point for a short while. And, and then I'll just sort of notice, huh, that was actually a lot harder than you might think. But I do believe that part of being a functional adult, being a high functioning person in any domain of life, is being able to control your impulses to do something different. You see this in the gym, actually. Uh, this is another place you could do this. So have you ever done this where you set, uh, probably you guys haven't, but you set out to do, let's say a set of curls. You're like, okay, I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do alternating dumbbell curls, right? And then at some point you switch to doing them simultaneous. And then you see people switching and do them alternate. Now there's nothing wrong with doing that. And I know that freestyling things can be very beneficial going by feel. But sometimes, and for some people, sticking to a regimen is actually what they need to learn how to do. And the gym is a great place to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. So having a plan and sticking to that plan, even if it's uncomfortable, is its own form of exercise, independent of the physical training that you're doing. Does that make sense? And following a plan and following a schedule can help the release of dopamine as well. Like when you stick to your diet, oh yeah, you go off your diet, you can get hit with dopamine because you ate ice cream, right? But right. you can also get hit with dopamine, and I think you might even get hit with more of it when you stay on point. Absolutely, but I think that's hitting milestones, amazing. hitting goals after. So anytime there's pain, the pleasure you're going to experience after that is much greater. Mm. This again is a is a, a you know I have to with all. Uh, I have to give credit to Anna Lemke's book, Dopamine Nation. She talks about this. If you get into the ice bath, for instance, cold water, there's always a wall getting in. Always ugh, the first. So I always think that's the first wall. Yeah. Then let's say you've never done ice bath. The, the second wall generally comes at about 30 seconds. So your goal that day is just to get past that second wall. I literally imagine myself crawling over that wall. The next time you get in, it's always the first wall. It's always a shock. And then you want to push that wall out to the next minute, then two minutes and three minutes. This can come with anything. You could be doing a crossword puzzle on the plane. I don't like crossword puzzles, but every once in a while I'll force myself to do it and you should finish it. It's the, it's in the finishing. 
and then you finish it and there's something so deeply satisfying about that even if it's something kind of trivial even if it's folding your clothes mm -hmm. you know a lot's been made of make your bed in the morning or fold your clothes or do the dishes the next time you find yourself doing the dishes do them really to completion right i have this habit of leaving the one thing because it's good enough right <laughs> doing things to completion is a tremendous dopamine hit and the more friction you feel the more pain the more reward you can expect and this is what Right, and actually it probably has roots in the challenge. You know, we, we have these challenges too as human beings, but it, for most species, mating is a very challenging thing. The males have to compete with one another. In most mammalian species, not every male gets to mate. A subset of them get to mate with the female sire, many, many offspring. And they have to fight in order to do it. Oftentimes they have to fight fasted, right? They have to fight injured. So there's all sorts of this stuff. And so this, and the reason we can leap to an example like that from crossword puzzles and not be outside the lane lines is that reward, friction, pain, the pain, pe pleasure balance. There's one set of circuitries in the brain and body for that. It's the same one that existed 100,000 years ago. It's not different for weight training in the gym or the crossword puzzle or the exam in school. Once you start seeing that those things are the same in terms of pro underlying neural process, mm -hmm. then you start saying, oh, okay. I can apply this to pretty much anything. And then of course you have the agency to decide what you want to apply it to. So learn to be a finisher. This is really important. Learn to be a finisher and learn to take on things that are hard. And then of course, bask in the dopamine that comes afterward and then do it again and again. And I think this is the kind of deeper layers of anything, whether or not you're talking about martial arts, weight training, academics, doesn't matter. It's all part of the same underlying process. What is hard is when people try something, they feel the friction and then they stop. Now you're sending your brain the signal that quitting is actually, like you said, then they go reward themselves with a lower, lesser reward. And you're training, you're training your nervous system to be weak. Mm -hmm. uh, but the good news is you can always fight your way back. But there's a neurochemical system involving acetylcholine. And it comes from these two little nuclei down in the base of the brain called nucleus basalis. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior. And it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. So for people that want to change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point. And the ability to access deep rest and sleep. Mm. Because most people don't realize this, but neuroplasticity is triggered by intense focus. But neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep and rest.